Okay, good morning guys, and thanks for coming out on this cold December morning. And uh, we're gonna get rolling, and I am not over there, but I am Phil, I'm 33, I'm from a town called Bray, which is in Ireland, in Dublin, or I just said the Dublin. It's a bit of a shithole, not a lot to do there, apart from play PlayStation, rob cars, I didn't do that, but yeah, I found skateboarding in Bray, and uh, I was also rubbish at that, so I ended up filming it instead and living through my friends who are better than me. So today I'm gonna to talk about time management and tools through time. I'm gonna use a project called Lightbox as an example. So what is Lightbox? It's a project I did with Levi's. Uh, it was seven films, um, part documentary, part animation, and we had one year to do it, which in reality was six months by the time we got the budget. And, and yeah, we're gonna use the flagship piece Lightbox Gray to demonstrate how we managed to do all of this work in such a short time frame. So we had to film and edit the footage. We had to produce a full soundtrack and we to produce the animation and I'm going to show you an excerpt from the clip and then we're going to deconstruct it. Here it goes.
So that was some of Lightbox Gray. So how do we make this? It was essentially three steps. And the first was obviously filming it. So a bunch of guys came over from the UK and we shot it on Super 8. So what is Super 8? It's an eight millimeter wide film format. It was developed in the 70s as a consumer camera for the average folk to shoot on. And it was the first kind of consumer accessible camera. And they're really good because they still work and they're very automatic. And yes, this is the film that we use in the camera and it's all sealed in plastic so it doesn't get any light in it. And I, after I shot it, I had to send it to Berlin where it's developed and then dried out on these racks. And then they spliced the film together and <coughs> sent it back to Malmo. Whoop. And uh, yeah, that's kind of what it looks like up close. But here I got it scanned. You can also do it yourself. But that whole process took three months. So yeah, it, quite a long time. So here's a few features of Super 8. This is color reversal film. Uh, that's actually my friend Egg who did the logo. Hi. And uh, yeah, you can see it's very vibrant, saturated, color negative. When you get it first, it looks like this. Then you got to reverse it. So we cross processed it to bump up the greens and make it look a little weird. You can use single frame on Super 8 and do time lapses or you can generally shoot quite spontaneously because you don't have the meter for the light. And this is uh, the most popular black and white film, Tri-X. You can see it's got a, got a very nice tones and contrasts and yeah, it's nice. And this is leader. This is what they put in to the projectors to get the film into it. But it, it's really good as a, an editing device. You can use it all over. Oh, step two, animation. OK. So my friend Mike O'Shea is an illustrator from London. And he um, did the animations. And it was, this was what he sent. So he just drew on paper and scanned it. So this was the very first thing I got and we had to test if it would loop, which it did, and then we could change the colors, key at the background, and but we still needed to save time because we didn't have the footage yet. So we just made all these kind of trippy loops that we could use anywhere in the edit because yeah, we knew we were on a gnarly deadline and we had to uh, make it. And here's Mike talking about his work. Well, think of how a chimp would do it and Go a bit further back <laughs> because I don't know how to do it properly. I was never trained. Uh, I'm not a trained animator. I kind of made it up. So it, they will just I just cut out pieces of paper and then use a light box and drew on them and then drew on more bits of paper like so. Well, the, the animation, the actually drawing part didn't take that long. Well, it would take like maybe a couple of days. Mm. But then scanning every every frame in and like re, re adjusting it and making sure they're all in the right order on, on and fixing, touching up on Photoshop. That took quite a while as well. And that was the bit I hated. That was like the boring bit. But I don't feel like I'm actually drawing drawing anything if I'm just drawing straight off the computer. Like there was some pieces where I had to, the first frame and the last frame had to um, connect to the footage, if that makes sense. And um, so I had to draw the first frame and the last frame, but then in between I could make up and do whatever I wanted. And I don't like to plan it beforehand because there's nothing exciting in that. It's already been done before you start drawing it. So I like the idea that I, I don't know what I'm doing until it's finished. And it can go a completely different way because it, 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 you can maybe start drawing something and you think you're gonna, it's gonna go that way, but then it kind of evolves and changes as you're doing it. So it keeps it interesting for me so that it's not so, um, because it can be quite a boring thing to do if if you let it. So with this, it doesn't get boring because you you get excited because you don't know how it's going to turn out, and you kind you want to see how it's going to turn out. So you kind of it's yeah it's best to for me to keeps it exciting for me if I make it up as I go along. 
Yeah, that was Mike who uh, did the illustration. So in the meantime, we had to produce a soundtrack and another one of my best friends, Gibbo, Andrew Gibbons was producing it and he's like a musical encyclopedia. So he just gave me like placeholders to edit over initially and then, yeah, he produced more specific stuff. So he used the MPC 2000, it's an analog sampler, but uh, we needed like analog tracks to match the analog footage and the analog illustra illustration. And because he's one of my best friends, I didn't have to tell him much. He just got stuff instantly. So he knew exactly what I wanted and he's, yeah, he's musical genius. And uh, his behind the scenes thing, he recorded the soundtrack on tape and I actually shot it on tape with a Fisher Price camera. So it's all tape and here's Gibbo. I pull something out off the shelf and I hit shift sample. And it's slow, so it's, there's a lot of lag. It's old, yeah, so there, it's. Um, and then I throw it on. My super duper record. Lower down, so I don't and you'll know when you look at a record, where the darker grooves are, you'll know it's just one or two instruments. Oh, it's a drum machine, it's an MPC. Um, MIDI Production Center, 2000 XL drum machine sampler. But it's a very outmoded piece of equipment. Um, but I like the fact that it's hands on, you can touch it. I have the record player going through the mixer back into the into the machine. It's just sampled a bit, so I, I'll play back what I just sampled. I can't really work any other way because I'm technically retarded. <coughs> so yeah, uh, we were all idiots. Uh, so with Super 8 and animation, we had tons of downtime and I had six other films to do in the meantime. So while the Super 8 was being processed and the animation was being done, Gibbo made more music and I just locked down the tracks I was going to use and use them as a script in a sense. Then I took advantage of uh, not outmoded technology and start shooting on HD, taking advantage of time because this is about time. And I was only shooting at sunset with a local kid called Daniel Rabia. And here's a short excerpt from Rabia's section. So I'm going to take a little break from that and talk about technology and time. And as technology progresses through time, what are we gaining and what are we losing? So what we're gaining is obviously speed. You can shoot really fast. You have the stuff instantly on your laptop. You can be really efficient with it. And the cost, it's once you've bought the camera, it's free. It's just on a memory card. and. Yeah, and hockey, that's what we're also gaining because I made a film about 
pro ex pro hockey player who now works at Brigadier Skate Organization in Malmo, guy called Jay Mag, and here's a very short clip from that, but I was able to make it quite quick because we just shot digitally. So here's Jay Mag. I've been playing hockey since I was six years, I think, uh, until I was 31. So yeah, hockey fever. Um, so yeah, that was J Mag, 41, very impressive guy. So what we're losing as technology progresses is tangibility. We've less uh, contact with our tools and a lot of mistakes and also selectivity because Super 8 works out like nowadays it's nearly 50 euro for every three minutes so I really don't film something unless I'm super confident with the composition so I think it makes you film better and be more patient so here's some mistakes leader like you wouldn't get that in high def uh, looks the exposures mess up a lot but it's kind of the unexpected stuff. Here's Hi8, which looks even worse. It's a tiny video format. Uh, not even, nothing professional about it, but that's kind of what's nice about it, is that everything looks so raw, and yeah, you can't really polish it up because it looks like crap, and that's kind of funny, and it's good because it's just skateboarding. So here's uh, all the cameras I use in the production. You can see up the top there's like high def GoPro stuff. There's Fisher Price and uh, Super 8, High 8, tons of stuff. But they're all uh, just consumer cameras. But they're just tools, and tools are however you use them. And creativity is not a new thing. So the ideas or the story should all always be come before the tools. And as a demonstration of this, I have my friend. Craig Questions, who also had a documentary in Lightbox, and he's a lunatic that I could go on a whole presentation about, but uh, he wasn't responding when I tried to film in, in high definition. He got very self-conscious, and while I was able to get nice compositions, I wasn't really getting the right message. So we'll show you his high def stuff right. first. There'd be a massive group of skateboarders and all of them will just like go to their separate ways and give up and there will always be three core skateboarders that survive from that group and that's what it feels it's hard to explain but it feels like you'll travel to find those core skateboarders mm. and you've all got that one thing in common and then it's like a big like a big group of skateboarders that are from all over the place but they're all in that one place together because it's like it's sort of like a journey that you know you forever search <laughs> You ever for searching, and you, you know you meet people that you know you meet some of the best people in the world for escape when you meet some of the worst. That's, but that's just life, I guess. So in general, I couldn't really lock him down to do to. I couldn't show what he was really like. But when I switched to high eight, for some reason, he liked that, and I could get more <laughs> authentic behaviour like this, where he leads to smile. So that was Craig, and um, yeah, <clears throat> story first, camera second. So what happened with Lightbox? We failed miserably. No, we uh, prioritized our jobs by timing and managed to deliver the project on time. 
And we got a Vimeo staff pick. Well, hey, um, Levi's were stoked with that. And then we went on holiday to Iceland. So uh, if you want to learn more about the films, uh, Instagram, Lightbox Film, or Phil Evans TV. And thank you very much for listening. Cheers. <laughs>